A very good uh, evening to all our viewers today. Today we have with us a very distinguished person under whose leadership Bharti Foundation has touched 40,000 children in 183 schools across six Indian states. She has also been honored as chair of SAFRG. She is on the board of Resource Alliance United Kingdom. Uh, she is one of the top 100 uh, women achievers by Ministry of Women and Child Development. And I saved this for the last, but it's the best. She has won the Karamveer Puraskar by National Citizens Award for Social Justice and Action. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome Ms. Mamta Saikia, CEO of Bharti Foundation. Welcome, Mamta. Sorry. Thank you so much. I was offline. Uh, something happened. So I've just come back. So uh, um, hello, everybody. Really good to join uh, all of you today. And I'm actually very excited to talk to Krisha. Uh, over the years, I think there's a lot of noise in the background. Uh, Harsha, who's over the years, has become a very close friend now. And uh, I've really admired her uh, energy, her passion, her never-say-die attitude. I think um, she's an inspiration for all the young people. And um, I think in many ways, uh, she symbolizes what, this, uh, what the young generation is all about startups, doing your own thing, making a difference in your own, you know, the way you want to. So, Harsha, I'm really very excited um, to be here and to be talking to you. Um, you are a person who inspires me. So, very, very happy to be here. We are little human beings <laughs> learning from uh, you and following your footsteps. <laughs> no. So, Mamta, uh, we are all very excited to learn your journey. Now, you come from uh, a science and IT background. What made you join the development sector? And I see that your journey has been phenomenal. But how do you feel about your journey? You know, um, you're very correct that I'm a science student. And um, after science, I joined MBA from IMT Ghaziabad. So, my father, who's a... Uh, um, who's uh, who's a maths person? He was a professor of statistics, and uh, he used to work in NCRT. And uh, you know who who actually uh, inculcated the scientific attitude uh, in me and my sister. Uh, he wasn't very happy when I joined MBA, huh? So he felt, uh, and he actually used this phrase, "Pade Farsi beche tel." You know, he said that you've been given a science education and now uh, you're doing MBA and you will go out selling things. And they were a little upset about it. But um, I was very clear that I wanted to do MBA. So you won't believe it. Of course, I've had my journey. Um, so I started being a science, you know, being a science person, physics person, plus an MBA. I started my journey uh, from a power sector consultancy firm. Uh, which seemed like a marriage between the two. Um, but after after a year or so, uh, you know, I used to work a lot on feasible, techno feasibility studies on steam turbines, gas turbines. But after a year or two, um, I think the turbines stopped talking to me. I just didn't feel like going to the office, you know, to pick up another techno economic feasibility study. That phase taught me a lot, mind you. But um, I wasn't able to connect with it. And that is when Cry came into my life. And um, I couldn't believe that I could use my marketing skills um, to actually, you know, help underprivileged children. And that was the year 1993. Uh, during those days, um, during those days, we didn't have MBAs joining in uh, social sector. I was among the first few who did that. You know, and actually all the MBAs who are now joining, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, there were a few of us who set this uh, movement, so to say. Um, it was in 
partly easy transition partly not so easy transition it was easy because it just made me feel uh, that i'm using my skills i'm using my energy i'm using my passion and i'm using my degree uh for something good uh cry as they say for me is history um i joined their uh, resource mobilization unit and um, set up their international operations and cry became i'm sure even today is uh one of the leading and premier agency raising funds from within india as well as abroad um that was a cry was an organization which in many ways defined me you know to be resourceful to to constantly go on trying to be never satisfied mm. so cry um, shaped me quite a lot and uh, after cry i think after 9 10 years i was struggling a lot with you know when you're very successful and you're very young you you struggle with the fact that am i good or was the organization uh, good so that is when i took a break uh, harsha for 3 3 and a half years i was a uh, like you an entrepreneur and um, i started working with a lot of ngos you know even to expand my own horizon and i must say those 3 and a half years when i worked with some of the international ngos some of the sm- small and struggling groups um uh, and i traveled i traveled in the far off villages and i traveled internationally um so that phase taught me quite a lot and in a way i rediscovered myself three and a half years of that and then bharti foundation found me and uh, i'm sure all of you know that um bharti foundation works uh, in the space of education we have over the years we've set up our own schools that harsha was talking about and there was a time i went offline so i do not know how much she could tell you about bharti foundation i may be repeating a little uh so bharti foundation has its own schools in the villages of our country 170 um, plus and these schools are absolutely free schools for underprivileged children in the villages uh, so we made sure that there are no barriers all children are able to access education and we also make sure that we give them free uniform free mid day meal free, free textbooks notebooks pencils crayons anything that a child wants um we have to make sure that all girls come into school so our girl child ratio given the fact that we are in the villages and we work with underprivileged communities um, 51% of our students are girls which i think is an impressive uh, ratio but over the years what we have started to do is that we've taken learnings from our own schools which are called satya bharti schools and we've taken some good practices and we started taking them into government schools to create an impact and that has been a inspiring journey and i'm hoping that at some stage harsha you will um, ask me questions on what kind of impact we've been able to make in government schools and with satya bharti school so i'll i'll reserve um, this part of the story for that section and i would uh, pause here uh excellent that's quite inspirational for all of us now as you rightly mentioned before joining bharti foundation you tried your hands in entrepreneurship me and many other girls as a upcoming entrepreneur would like to know more about it harsha when you are there i should not be talking about entrepreneurship now you're embarrassing me <laughs> no no we I'll, we all want to know about it it was a very exciting phase harsha uh, i realized two things first uh is the importance of uh, establishing your credibility uh that is very important because if you want to uh you know start your own business who are you are you credible enough that people can trust you um uh, so i was very lucky that working with cry my credibility in resource mobilization and what i had achieved for cry my credibility was um well established the second most important thing is uh, something that i'm not very good at i must con- must confess but um, there are there were some kind people i'm using the word network um that you have to have network of people who who would encourage you who would support you 
you know you need that circle of positivity around you um i i i can't claim that i am very good at uh, networking i'm sure of the, all the people who are here today very few of you would know me um but uh, thankfully you know when you put in good work uh, you do tend to make friends and friends that i make are friends for life uh, so there were there were well wishers who who support you in this journey who introduce you and who who recommend you uh, so i think building a network is very critical um of course initially there were phases when you don't have enough work um all entrepreneurs go through that but but once you start building that cycle of business it starts coming in then it picks up um so in my case it 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 picked up and it picked up very well so much so that um Uh, i reached a stage where i realized that now i can't handle it as an individual advisor individual consultant i would now have to you know kind of set up an organization and uh, you know so i reached that stage when bharti foundation happened so that's another life decision one takes that uh, am i am i to continue an entrepreneurship journey or would i like to uh, like to see what bharti foundation and its journey has to offer Uh, i've had an exciting journey uh, not a moment of regret uh, uh, of the decision that i took harsha but those um two and a half three three odd years taught me quite a lot and um, and i had i had a lot of fun and lot of learning i mean the kind of exposure i got in in that period was immense so i i look look back to that period with a lot of fondness wonderful uh that means a lot to all of us uh now mamta you have been very inspiration for all of us uh in the in these trying times when the world has been at standstill due to the breakdown of covid-19 foundations where your prime work is on the ground also came, became came to standstill now how did you as a leader handle these sudden crises and what were what were your immediate steps when they just suddenly spoke about lockdown and no one could uh, move out of their house what did you do as a leader um you know three things essentially um the first was if you remember the first lockdown there was a lot of uh, fear of unknown people didn't even know what they were dealing with right um so for me the first thing was are people feeling okay um uh, are they home are they safe because you know that a lot of people who are doing field job are not even in the places where their family is right there are a lot of youngsters who who are living alone so my 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 first first thought in my mind was about the team and people and what are those youngsters doing who are now alone and um, you know do they have enough food do they have enough grains in their house uh you know i don't remember now but i don't think we knew how long the uh lockdown would last um so first was to take care of that there was a lot of phone calling uh, a lot of looking after people uh making sure that uh, they were okay safe had food can survive the second thing was to actually understand you know sitting in delhi you can um, you're sitting in a privileged city right delhi is delhi um uh, you have to get a sense of what is happening on the ground right what are people experiencing what does a lockdown in a village in up means what does a lockdown uh, in a village of rajasthan means and what does a lockdown in a uh, village in punjab means and what does it mean in delhi the completely different um uh, pictures so there was a immediate uh, uh, chain of command set up which was completely virtual and we uh, uh, we immediately sensed and it, everything was happening within hours so i am not saying we took a very weak sensing so uh, the the team from head office was completely connected uh, and we got a sense of what is happening and what is not happening in the villages where the people are where children are where teachers are in terms of mind space uh safety and things like that 
And third thing we did was a lot of decentralization because this was an unprecedented situation. Nobody sitting at head office uh, uh, in Delhi, in Gurgaon, can decide what should happen and how should it happen in the villages. Um, so there was one whole day of ideation where even the head teachers and teachers, uh, they got back saying, what is it that they can do and what is it that they can't do? Um, so these, I mean, caring for people first, getting a sense of the ground reality, and third was decentralization. I mean, I'm so proud of Party Foundation team. Within four to six days, the entire Bharti Foundation system, the virtual network of schools got set up, right? In the in the first go itself, we had 70% plus children connected over smartphones in terms of virtual classes. And our teachers, obviously, virtual pedagogy is a completely different ballgame. I mean, it's a different thing you're using technology in a classroom. It's a completely different process when you are virtual and you're teaching children. And children who have a single phone in their house, I mean, that's their father's phone, which has to be accessed by their brother or their sisters or even their cousins at times. Um, so there were a lot of challenges uh, on the ground, which were, I mean, I'm very inspired by our teachers, how they managed it, because they took certain classes twice, because certain students would get phones in the morning, certain students would get phone in the evening. Uh, there were 30% of the children who were not connected those children who didn't have a smartphone, uh, the teachers started doing voice calls. And imagine teaching over a voice call and calling back the student after a day to then listen into the child as to what the child has understood. Um, so a lot was left to the decision making at ground. Of course, uh, after a few weeks, we started tying everything together and making certain standard practices. Uh, hats off to academic team because on one hand, they started training teachers on basics of virtual pedagogy. I mean, teachers didn't even know how to make Google Forms. How many of us knew how to make Google Forms, right? So they started training them first on basic things that how to do this, you know, a uh, 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 synchronous call, synchronous video call. They started training them on basic tools of technology. Then they started moving towards virtual pedagogy. I mean, to an extent that our teachers now make uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, teaching learning material uh, over technology. So very proud of the transition. But I think the mantra was listen to what the ground is saying, uh, understand what they can do and build on it. So um, I think the Bharti Foundation team um, just got onto their feet within 48 hours and a lot of other NGOs. I mean, a lot of, a lot, lot of government teachers also. I've heard such inspiring stories. Um, this time, teachers have done wonderfully well. I don't know how many of us uh, know about it or talk about it, uh, including government teachers, all the teachers across the world, actually. Wonderful stories of how they've reached out to students and children. It's wonderful. Uh, I totally reckon with uh, what you're saying over here. Uh, now, Mamta, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it has been a trying time. Uh, sitting back at home for a young person and trying to cope up with life, many of them suffered uh, with uh, mental health challenges, uh, including, uh, including staff members. So how did your team cope up with this? Um, you know... I'm so glad you brought it up because uh, not uh, when one talks of education and what children have suffered, everybody talks of learning levels. And of course, there is huge learning loss. You see, the reality is, at least our children and most of the children who are covered by government schools as well in the villages, these children come from underprivileged families, right? Um, even in cities, uh, many of them lost their employment. Uh, many families faced uh, serious issues of food or, uh, you know, financial issues. Now, apart from everything else that a child may or may not be going through, right? There could be certain other kind of illness at home and the child is disturbed because of that. 
there were added stress uh, of COVID. And you know, in 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 uh, when there are schools working, when the child is in school for those five six hours, the five six hours the child forgets uh, the stress at home. But now they were day in and day out um, sitting at home. So what we did, um, I think somewhere around September 2020 or October 2020, I don't remember the month exactly, but that was the time we had established contact with most, uh, you know, a large number of our children. I think we had crossed 75 or 80 percent of the students. Uh, students had also got trained in um, how to use Google Forms and things like that you know, over these weeks, uh, because teachers had started giving them homework, assignments, and some kind of questionnaire, objective type questions over Google Forms and things like that. The students were also getting trained on how to use it. So during that period, we actually did something called happiness survey. You know, so there were three three smileys sent, sad, straight, and a smiley, you know. So uh, Children. And with senior senior students, we asked a few questions as well. For junior students, you just sent to uh, these three smileys to get a sense of where children are. Uh, and we found, Harsha, that uh, as the classes were getting, uh, you know, so a lot more happiness in junior classes. And as you, as you as you went towards the board classes, we actually saw the the happiness ratio dropping down. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, these are our kids. We knew them by name and everything. Um, so they were uh, each, at least in senior classes, each answers were uh, analyzed. And we have counselors in our schools. Um, so there was a uh, there was a two pronged strategy we took. We we immediately introduced um, happiness classes, and uh, teachers were trained on you know before they take any class, what are the kind of activities you know, that they should do uh, to help children get into a livelier and happier mood and, uh, and you know, get a sense of also they were trained on how to identify if a child is in stress and, uh, you know, how to call up that child and uh, get a sense of what's happening and talk to parents and things like that. In case of senior students, uh, especially our counselors did exemplary work, I must say. Uh, they connected with students. Uh, now that schools have opened, I mean, initially when children came in, uh, schools opened last year as well in November, especially for board classes. Uh, you know, when children walked in, you could, if I may use a Hindi word, you could you could see thode sehme hue the, you know, because for months you've been at home, there is a disease you don't know much about. Uh, but as they started coming regularly to schools, even, I mean, teachers were a little worried because suddenly you're exposing yourself to 15, 20 children in a classroom. Uh, we never filled up the classroom. We always kept it at 30% to 40% uh, capacity. But it was scary for teachers as well. Um, so it took time for that energy uh, to, to come back into classroom. The saddest thing is if you're smiling, your face is covered. You know, uh, People can't even make out that you're smiling. Um, but things improved. Our counselors then started doing face-to-face -face sessions with children who were kind of feeling um, that they needed some help. Um, but even today, while physical schools are happening, now it has become part of our life, you know, um, the sense of energizing students and uh, to, to get a sense of where each child our teachers have been trained. Um, that has been now ingrained, uh, made a part of all our processes. But we're happy that now schools are functioning and there is some sense of semblance of normalcy now among students. It's been a, a trying time for uh, all of us, and it's good to see that things are getting back to normal. It's because of leaders such as you. Uh, now, uh, Bharti Foundation, as we see, that um, has footprints across um, six Indian states, more and more so in the rural uh, schools. Uh, how did you envision to digitize education in rural India? And also, you earlier mentioned about voice-based learning solutions. So how did that, that thing really function? Uh, so 
uh, one thing, Harsha, uh, our own schools, Satyabhati schools are in six states. The Bharti Foundation is today in 15, 16 states. So we are in Jammu and Kashmir. We are in Assam. We are in Meghalaya. So we've uh, five years back, we expanded our footprint quite a lot. And I think uh, for so many years, we were only operating with our own schools that people don't know about it. We are in Jharkhand now. We are in, you know, so we are in 16 states now. Uh, we've gone to Karnataka, Telangana. Right? So we've expanded wonderful, quite a lot. Wonderful. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> thank you. So that's where, like I said, Keith, that's a journey I want to talk about when we took yeah. learnings from uh, uh, our own schools into uh, government schools, and which is where our expansion happened. So at some stage, um, I would like to talk about it. Um, so, you know, as far as technology is concerned, um, Today, now, after COVID, uh, nobody can deny the kind of role technology played, right? It may not have been as impactful and effective, uh, let's say, as in privileged schools. In schools like us, right, where underprivileged children are there because uh, I forget having a laptop at home. Like I said, some of them didn't even have smartphone. And if they had smartphone, they were actually sharing it with their brothers, sisters, cousin brothers, cousin, cousin sisters. So if if you had if 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 siblings had a class each time, so they would decide either basis subject or basis whose class is senior that who would attend this class, who would get the phone to attend the class. So uh, you know, technology means different things depending on the context that you are in, right? So even so, when I say a synchronous class, it doesn't mean that you know um, here is a laptop and. All, all the children are sitting at home at laptop. A synchronous class um, actually means that a teacher has a little mobile in her hand and and she could actually be using a, a, a blackboard in her house to teach children so that children can actually see what teacher is doing. Like I said, to move teachers from what they could do when uh, COVID started, basis their own abilities, their own connections to what or, and how they should do is a journey, right? Um, so what we are looking at right now is Harsha. Our children are our children. They would never have laptops, touch wood. I mean, let there be a time that uh, each child or each family could have a laptop. Um, but in foreseeable future, we know that the situation at home will always be like that, one phone in the family, correct? Um, so as long as schools are working, it becomes a responsibility of schooling system like ours to make sure that uh, they have the access um, to technology. And one good thing that has happened over this period is that A, teachers have become very comfortable with the technology and they've seen the power of technology. And there is no going back even for them. They now know that they can access so many apps. They now know that there are such wonderful videos existing on YouTube and other places uh, which can actually help explain uh, concepts better. Many teachers are actually saying that it's cleared up their concepts as well, the wonderful material that exists. Uh, and most of it is free of cost, which is very, very good. So there is no going back um, for anybody. And if any, any system does not make use of the journey that teachers have made, I think then we'll be failing our children all over again. So we have to really build on that, which means that we must provide technology in schools now so that teachers continue to use the comfort levels that they have developed with technology and the excitement with which they use technology now. Same is the case uh, with children as well as parents. Because the phone belonged to the father or the mother, they were very keenly involved with what their child is studying. I mean, they were they were instrumental in downloading the uh, downloading the apps. They were instrumental in opening the app, registering, you know, where they could registering the child, correct? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so everybody is now on to technology, and we have to make sure that we continue this energy and this momentum uh, into all the schools, not only Bharti Foundation uh, schools. So, in Bharti Foundation, what we're doing is. Um, um, it's a, it's a, it's a little on a lower cost uh, intervention, something uh, that we call digital classes, where we're giving a TV with a mobile phone uh, to teachers so that they can actually 
Uh, and now there's a lot of content which has been curated by our academic team. Um, so we, we're actually um, giving this TV come mobile phone, come speakers um, kind of setup in our schools where teachers can actually download interesting content and while they are teaching, use that uh, you know, as part of their uh, lesson plan, as part of to support them while teaching. And uh, our, we'll make sure and our teachers are making sure that they continue to share interesting links um, with children and their parents so that at home, whenever a child can find time with the phone, the children continue to access, um, uh, you know, content uh, online. So that those processes will continue um, to happen. Apart from that, yes, our schools have small, uh, small computer labs where children are given time to, uh, you know, do one-on-one -on -one work or group work. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and as far as that voice course that you were talking about, Harsha, that was a very simple thing. It was, it wasn't as if um, you know there was some special app or technology or this thing. I think it was just a passion of our uh, teachers. Um, so they would take four or five students on phone call, conference call, tell them to open a particular page in the book, read through, explain the concept, uh, give them an assignment, call them child by child next day to listen in what the child understood, explain further if needed be. That was really a lot of human intervention while using the phone. Um, but um, the kind of children that we have, um, that is the best they could have done uh, in those circumstances. Wonderful, Mamta. That's a lot of work and a lot of employee engagement. So now in the best interest of time, I'm going to combine my questions. Uh, what are the employee engagement models and what have been your key learnings uh, and um, uh, success indicators impact created uh, under your uh, uh, guidance by with Bharti Foundation. How did you employ, engage all of them and what impact did you create? See, impact, I think, is uh, visible in the kind of work that got done. I mean, I was surprised at uh, uh, people almost working around the clock, you know, because through the day you would be in conference calls or the quality team would be virtually attending the classes to see the quality of classes happening, feed that back to academic cell, even academic team entering the classrooms, virtual classrooms of teachers. So, and they would do their desk job, report writing or curriculum making perhaps at night. I have no idea uh, how people found so many hours in 24 hours of the day. I am, um, I cannot tell you that. Um, you know, of course there were, they were, and most of the HR departments do undertake those joyful sessions. You call inspirational uh, leaders who come and talk to them, inspire them. Uh, as a as a leader, I undertook a few activities. You know, one was, I think during those days, I talked a lot to, I talked a lot to uh, the team. Um, I would almost every every month or every 15, 20 days send them a letter, you know, which would be screenshot and send over WhatsApp to up to teacher level. Um, just, you know, energizing them, egging them on, telling them that I know how tough it is and I know uh, it's not easy, but, you know, we all are safe. And Bharti Foundation actually was very lucky. Uh, we, we had very uh, few cases that would... Uh, so just sending them positive energies, positive messages. Um, but every alternate day, uh, HR would randomly pick up uh, five to six employees, you know, cutting across. I've spoken to teach. I've even spoken to students uh, at home. Um, so every alternate day, I would be in call with five, six people uh, trying to get direct information on how are things happening on the ground? How are they feeling? How is their family and stuff like that? So that, um, God, that was, those were the days when there was very hectic uh, connect with the team. I did another very interesting thing, which um, I think brought everybody together. So I am the oldest employee in Bharti Foundation. My employee ID number one, you know. So in my computer, there are oldest of the photographs which most of the employees have not seen, right? 
there was a time I was actually operating alone before the team started coming in. So what I did, I, I spent a lot of time picking out, you know, going through my laptop, going through my emails and picking out oldest of the photographs, which nobody would have seen. And I, I was supposed to do four sessions. I couldn't do the fourth session because the almost semi-normal world came back. But I did three sessions, one session a month where I told them story of old programs and, you know, showed them photographs and, you know, the kind of work that Bharti Foundation did so that everybody got a sense of where we started from and how the journey, you know, uh, to actually tell them the journey, why we are here and the kind of path we've traveled. And it was so wonderful to remember old employees, uh, you know, because each old employee has contributed a lot to Bharti Foundation. Um, to actually to, to, to tell them, hey, there was this person who did this and tell them the name, you know, to make, make those photographs come alive. Those sessions were very energizing for people to know history of Bharti Foundation, and I enjoyed doing that. Um, of course, there was reward and recognition. We, we celebrated people who had done wonderful work. Um, but most of the team leaders were doing similar exercises, calling up people, finding out are they okay at home. I think, especially for this period, human connect meant a lot. And that is what energized teams, knowing that they're not alone. I mean, whenever a few cases happened, I know how entire Bharti Foundation team got together to make sure that that family had everything that they needed. Um, so that for this period, that has been the mantra, Harsha. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, that That's a lot of passion and compassion. That's what we see over here among uh, each employee of Bharti Foundation, which reflects from the leader herself. Uh, now, uh, what is your vision for Bharti Foundation for the coming five years? And how can other NGOs also work with uh, you under your leadership? Oh, well, I learn a lot from other NGOs. Please don't say that. I mean, uh, there is so much of wisdom and uh, excellent work that is happening on the ground that uh, I mean I as a person uh, I know there's so much to learn to see what is being done and I'm I'm constantly amazed by the energy of young people who are in the NGOs so um, they are the leaders small NGOs are the leaders they they do exemplary innovative work Harsha um, you know um, what we've done last five years, and that's the journey we now want to expand into. When we set up our own schools, our objective was to actually understand what it takes to deliver quality education. What are the conditions under which quality education uh, can be delivered, right? Everybody talks of quality education. And we were very sure that let's first experience Let's first ask and see, can we give quality education? It's so easy to criticize anybody and saying, hey, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. But do we have what it takes? That's why we set up Satya Bharti schools, you know, and it wasn't an easy journey. Even today, it isn't an easy journey. I mean, we at any point of time, we 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 have a our own grading system. At any point of time, there are schools in C grade. You're constantly working with head teachers to make sure that these schools improve, do better. So uh, it isn't that there is a there is a magical solution on how to make sure that all schools are doing well. I mean, uh, if 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 you're an honest organization which is analyzing uh, the work that is by being done on the ground, honestly, you will always see that a set of schools, a set of students, or set of teachers, or set of head teachers who need help, right? Um, but we did that because we wanted to. We we that's why we set up schools in the villages, right? Where you would have the problem of infrastructure, where um, where you would have the problem of quality of resources that you would get, because not that it is easy to deliver quality education in the cities, but we felt that if we could learn how to deliver quality education, if we could learn what are the conditions that must be created in the school to deliver quality education, then perhaps we would come up with certain learnings which could be taken into government schools. Uh, so in 2013, 14, we actually started taking baby steps into government schools. And our philosophy of change actually was very simple. You know, we actually looked at some of our well-performing schools right. and we found two things that were different. Okay. The 
first one is very obvious one you know leadership right uh, how good is the principal or the head teacher but what does having a good head teacher and principal translate into on the ground and we found that wherever our head teachers or principals could understand the vision of holistic development of children wherever our head teachers and principals could understand that if your school is a happy school where teachers are excited to come and teach where students are excited to come and learn so that they are not you know they're not uh, going on chutti every second day and not attending the school and therefore missing out what's happening and a school which celebrates a child who may not be very good at studies but is very good at extempore or is very good at sports if you start celebrating children for who they are if they become champions of the students i'm sorry i guess there is a glitch uh, in the technology uh, well we all find that uh, so we would uh, we would just uh, please give us a few few seconds and we'll be back in the interim period dr michael hopkins how are you doing hi harsha uh, very busy uh, I, i don't know why uh it's uh without moving so so many things to do it's such a lot of interest as i said yesterday to you uh, can you hear me okay yes yes absolutely absolutely okay yeah as i said yesterday uh the world the world has changed and and i think the more sedentary you are the more involved you are <laughs> um but and I thought it was pretty interesting one thing she she mentioned was about uh, education and how do you how do you communicate it and the thought that came to me and when she comes back maybe you you might want to raise that with her because I've got to go in 5 or 10 minutes and uh, my is the best way of of uh, of learning as you know is learning by doing so the more that you can get uh, your audience to to do things to be involved from algebra to woodwork to whatever um, nothing beats actually trying to do it as much as you can because as you know uh, you are a very good listener um you might have didn't attend our seminar about a month ago um which was on listening and um, it was it was pretty much informative actually Anyway, I see that your speaker's come back. So pass okay. back to her again, Speak. Harsha. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea how I dropped back. I was speaking very energetically. I think I pressed on some key which <laughs> took me out, I think. I think the cursor Happen. may have been on leave studio. So uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I I don't uh, I I know that I was talking about our movement into government schools. So anyway, uh so we realized that so our, our philosophy of change was very clear. When we started partnering government schools, you know government schools have excellent set of teachers. There uh, I don't know how many of you have visited government schools uh, uh you know frequently very good principals, impressive principals. the only thing we took into the schools was to create an atmosphere of happiness team bonding um to identify student leaders who will energize the school and that is what our quality support model is all about we do not when we when we work with government schools in our quality support model we do not intervene in academics at all right because principals and teachers know what they are doing the only thing that we want to do is to make sure that um students are energized they start exploring their other uh, talents their other skills we set up clubs we start taking them into external competitions um, initially it's difficult to get participation you train them they participate they start winning and suddenly these trophies start coming into government schools and i am not saying that they are already not winning but not all schools not a large number of students are participating and when students start gaining that confidence imagine there is a club leaders there are uh, you know 
school leaders, you set up a student council that takes charge of cleanliness of school. Suddenly there's a lot of energy and teachers feel good. You know, when students are energized, so we've uh, around three years back or four years back, um, we got an, uh, you know, kind of evaluation done after five years of doing this project. And this uh, researching team, I forget the agency which did this research for us. So they spoke to a set of teachers who were new into government schools, you know, these government schools where the Bharti Foundation was working. And these teachers said that we're coming from other government schools. And in this school, we find so much of energy. Students are interested in studies. They are asking us questions. The moment there is a function in the school, be it Independence Day, Republic Day, we don't even have to worry. Students have already taken charge. And there is entire energy in the school to make that uh, function happen. So only thing Bharti Foundation does is to give that dose of energy, you know, in students and in teachers. The the we've seen attendance going up. Uh, we've seen schools becoming cleaner. We're seeing such confidence in students, their communication skills, etc. And um, in 2020, we were actually planning to do a kind of impact on um, uh, students, you know, vis-a-vis -vis kind of uh, in, 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 in the space of their communication skills, their leadership skills and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, COVID happened and uh, all our work of last uh, three, four years, which we had in invested in the schools, uh, these one and a half years have really, um, you know, taken it away. Um, but the initial study that we had done had shown very good uh, impact in terms of students' attendance, students accessing libraries, uh, teachers' happiness quotient. Teacher, teachers were very happy coming to the school. Uh, we do help teachers if they need, uh, you know, any special training or something. We organize it for them. That is more need-based and ask-based. Um, um, so, so. That is the program that we're running uh, in government schools, Harsha. Wonderful, uh, uh, Mamta. Now, uh, it's uh, it's very uh, important for all of us to know how you guys are doing it so that we could also look at how others could replicate these kind of uh, models uh, uh, learning from you all. Now, last but not the least uh, question. IICSR is a dedicated institution for uh, research and development training project advisory implementation in responsible business leadership. What courses do you think that we should impart for the present and future generations and what kind of project implementations uh, you think we could introduce for the furthering of responsible business leadership in times to come? Oh, very big question, Harsha. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember seeing your uh, list of courses and also a bit of your curriculum. I mean, there is, uh, I would say there's immense, immense amount of, uh, you know, uh, thinking which has gone already into it. I, uh, you know, to be able to tell you what more, I, I should be remembering what all was there. But I remember getting impressed with it that there's a lot of thinking and I'm sure you had involved industry experts and you had involved people from development sector. It was so much obvious that it was there. Um, you know, having worked so many years now in this sector and looking at many youngsters also coming in, I, I've not um, seen any youngster graduating from your school. So maybe what I'm saying is not relevant for you. Um, you know, there is uh, there's one area... Uh, of gap that I find um, among these students is their inability to look at data, you know? And I'm not just saying analyzing data, just look at data and understand what this data is trying to tell you. Figures have a story behind it, right? The same figure in a different context means something else and the same figure in a different context means something else. It doesn't mean the same thing in different contexts, right? Um, so I, I've seen, I've seen very passionate people. They understand program. They understand ground realities. They understand environment. But the thing is to be able to um, implement impactful programs, um, you have to have an eye for data. There are times I believe that perhaps it's a God's gift. Uh, but frankly speaking, I think everything can be trained. People can be trained into everything. So somewhere 
um, ability to read data, ability to play with data, um, uh, ability to even think what data to seek out. Uh, I, I see that missing, you know, and, and, and if you don't have that, if you if you're not comfortable with numbers, uh, I'm not saying the the passion of work or quality of work goes down. Um, but then there are certain mis you would have to make certain mistakes to learn uh, what is good and best, whereas there are times that data can give you those hints um, way early in your uh, learning curve. So that is one area statistics perhaps i'm a daughter of a statistician therefore uh, so statistics and sense of numbers should be there in that i would include financials you know um so anybody who's into csr or in project this thing um making budgets but more importantly how to make budgets that are reasonable without impacting the quality of your program. It's very easy to put a figure and say, okay, this multiplied by 12 months, I require this much of money, but is this the best way to deliver it? Are there more cost-effective ways, you know, and it's not necessary that cost-effective way impacts quality. So there are times I actually challenge my team saying, Ki, again, I'm using Hindi. You know, that I won't give you any budget, but get this done. You know, so sometimes you have to challenge these youngsters that anything that you want to do doesn't mean that now there is a budget needs to be sanctioned. One has to be very resourceful about things. And sometimes, sometimes you don't have to create new structures for anything new that you want to do. How do you build upon the existing structures and use that? So I think a sense of numbers. And how numbers tell a story or how you can build a story using numbers. I think that's an ability which I uh, find lacking um, in some of the new graduates that are coming in. Harsha. Thank you. Thank you, Mamta. I still use the pen and paper. I recollect the first meeting <laughs> at Bharti Foundation. And I was writing all the notes. And one of your colleagues was like, you can keep the pen and paper. And you you really like well, pen and paper. <laughs> yeah, that's I still have all my notes. <laughs> no, very nice. I'm impressed. <laughs> I, I'm also so, a pen and paper person, completely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, it has been wonderful chatting with you. We have uh, some of our distinguished guests panelists who would also have few questions i would appreciate if you could answer some of our Absolutely. fellow trainers dr hopkins some of our students um so i, I would leave the floor uh, for them so over to you oh have you given me the floor sorry i was uh, switching around you know what computers are like what a nuisance i am i'm so sorry uh, <laughs> good evening, Dr. Hopkins. <laughs> good evening, Mamta. I very much enjoyed your, your talk. And uh, my goodness, you got such experience. I think we could listen to you for, uh, for days no, with what you're no. doing. But, you, know, you know, believe it or not, I, I, I started life off as a statistician all those, all those years ago. Um, and so I've always been very keen on, 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 on numbers and the rest of it. And how numbers get thrown around these days. It's like you know, everybody sees the color purple as green. Uh, the, same, the same with numbers. Um, I, had, I had one comment as you were, uh, or one thought as you were, you were speaking, which I mentioned when the, when the sound went off, um, which, is, which is how do you best teach? And uh, well, of course, that's, <laughs> that's a million dollar question uh, that is very, very difficult to, to do. But, um, w one thing that occurred to me as you were, you, were, you were speaking was that learning by doing is, is key uh, to get people to, to get involved. And uh, e even the, the slackest person in the class, to get them involved in, in some way, uh, because they always, they always remember that. You know, I, I remember, uh, I think when I was 11 years old, I was taught how to plane wood and how to drill a hole in metal. You know, I was 11. I have never forgotten. Not that people are asking me to drill holes in anything these days, except ideas, I think. But, uh, but certainly learning by doing, I think, is, is incredible. And I'm sure with your experience, you, you've done that. And I also mentioned, actually, it came off the top of my head, um, that even teaching algebra, 
much better to get you to do it. You know, what does X with the little two on the top mean? Uh, give me some examples uh, and then move on from there. Get people involved and don't, don't assume that they're all following you. I think the days of lecturing where we go on for hour after hour, I, th I stopped doing that 20 years ago. I got so tired and so bored with myself to be quite honest. And that's the worst thing to do. But I'm sure that uh, in your work, you know all these things. I'm just telling you to suck eggs, which you use an expression. Uh, Harsha also told me that you are CEO of YouTube. Is that YouTube in India or, or Asia? No, no, no. It's Bharti uh, Foundation. I work for Bharti Foundation. Nothing to do with oh. YouTube. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, then, then it must have been a mistype from Harsha, which is very unusual. She's really on top of things. So <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry for that. Um, actually, maybe you should be. But <laughs> <laughs> for, a, anyway. for a person who still takes notes in pen and paper, no. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, you might think that you do, but look. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but I'm no, taking I mean, notes I mean, of what you're saying. <laughs> it, it is, uh, I'm surprised that Sharsha falls into that bracket, but I think 50 plus are all pen and paper still. I, I, we prefer I, I our think, pen and paper. I think so too. But, but if you're like me, you lose pens quicker than the paper. <laughs> Anyway, nice speaking to you. Let, let, let me go right now, but thank you very much for, for, for joining Harsha and her team. And I see that a lot of very interesting people who are listening. So I'm sure it's, the, the continuation is going to be excellent. So bye-bye. Very nice to have met you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Hello. Hi, Johnny. Are you in a Hi, public good evening, space? Good evening, please no, keep on wearing. You're not in a public yeah. space, no? Let's keep on no, wearing. I'm in a, no, I'm in a I'm in a closed uh, room, and nobody is okay. there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, I just have a very basic question. So, uh, education is a sector wherein we say uh, normally that there is a difference between the output and the outcome. So oh, education is the sector wherein the output itself takes a lot of time. I mean, to measure the impact, I mean, unless the student clears 10th grade or uh, maybe the basic qualification, we don't know what is the impact he or she has created. So uh, it requires a lot of patience. So what are your views on that? I completely agree uh, with you, Johnny, because you see, when we set up our schools, we're not in a short term it's not a short-term thing for us, right? I mean, even today, children who uh, left us eight, you know, uh, some of our schools are primary schools, so children pass out um, uh, uh, out of class five, right? Even after eight years, we are tracking them. I'm worried that after finishing their 12th, will they go for college or not, correct? After college, are they picking up any employment or not? So you're, you're very, very correct. Education is, so you see, on one hand, uh, we do uh, we try and track our students uh, till the time the employment stage is there. I mean, right now we've not been there for so many years that after employment, then are they? Let's say our vision would be that after employment they should continue to do something for their society. Are they doing it or not? Are they contributing some funds to the causes or not? I mean, these are some of the things we'll pick up. Uh, our students have just started to get into employment age. Correct. We we started our schooling program in 2006. Um, so, but there are a lot of other things that we look at um, while students are in while students are in school. So there are definitely some immediate changes than what one looks at. Correct. So today, when children are coming back, children are no more used to sitting in a in a classroom for three hours, 45 minutes straight. Where are children used to it? Right. Correct. Now at home, they would see a video, get bored, they will go out, talk to their mom, come back. So suddenly, the the first things that you look at is that which are the schools where children have now become used to sitting in classroom, they're attending schools daily, correct? Um, so the kind of segments that we are working with, forget COVID time, the kind of segment that we are working with, are parents giving enough importance to education, be it girl, be it boy, 
right? It shouldn't be a simplest thing at the home. There's marriage in the house or there's marriage in neighbor's house or somebody in the village and suddenly students are not coming to school. That means they're not giving importance to education, right? So you start seeing, uh, I, I'm using the word impact in an English form, not in technical form, but you start seeing the impact of the quality of education and the work of your teachers when you see that the, the attendance of students is improving, which means you've been able to change the mindset of Parents, they've started to appreciate the role education can play in their children's life. I actually find, Johnny, that uh, to, to only look at learning levels and exam results as the final goal, and many educationists have said that I'm not saying anything new, but uh, I don't even worry so much about results per se. Results, I mean, if there are board exams at once a year event that happens in a students life but there are a lot of small things that go on happening in a child's life but you have to be a very sensitive institution to notice that to believe in that and to monitor that correct so we identify shy children in our classes and in our schools our teachers monitor them that when they when they actually start participating in functions when they start going into group events and from group events they move on to solo events where they get the confidence on speaking in front of people. So um, so there are shades and shades of changes that one brings into a child's life. And yes, there are certain changes you can start seeing immediately, right? When little kids come to school, they cry. They don't want to come to school. But in if there are, there is a pre-primary teacher who within two, three days, all children are not crying while they're entering the schools. You know that your teacher has made an impact, right? She gave them wonderful two days and that's why children are not crying. Um, so it depends on as an education system, what are the things that are important to you? Um, most of the things are long term, like you said, uh, but there are enough and more uh, changes um, that one can observe uh, even in short term. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Arun, sir, are you there? Okay, uh, his uh, question is, uh, they, uh, yes, Arun, sir? You are not audible, sir, you are not audible. Could you switch on your mic, please? Good evening, am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. Yes, you uh, are. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, uh, Mamta, ma'am, thank you so much for taking us uh, through for with your uh, with your journey and how you have uh, uh, you know uh, started journey from your corporates and then ending up building lives in the remote areas uh, through education, which is uh, I'm really touched. Uh, somehow, I'm also a person who was basically an engineer and then. Uh, because the machines would not uh, talk to me. And <laughs> that was the reason I left. Uh, I was working with Swaraj Master, then I left and I started teaching. And today I work for the leprosy of Wow. So, wow. ma'am, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, uh, currently we are planning for a project uh, in leprosy colonies for children uh, of leprosy affected. What we have found in our, pre, uh, you know, uh, in our previous experience that uh, children from leprosy background, uh, since their parents are not able to pay for their tuitions and also uh, because of social uh, stigma and discrimination, uh, children, they avoid taking tuitions outside or their parents are not able to send them. So what we were thinking now is to start some digital classes in the leprosy colonies itself. We are looking for funders for this. So we are... Uh, uh, we are sure we will get, but I would uh, here I would like to take your suggestions uh, how we should start. You know, uh, if uh, only one or two tips you can give us, that would be very useful for us. Arunji, where are you based? Which part of the country? 
uh ma'am actually anara india foundation works uh, uh, in seven states myself i am located at delhi in delhi we we'll, uh, we look after six leprosy colonies and uh, in total in seven states which includes uh, bihar jharkhand rajasthan uttarakhand uh, and uh, west bengal so in these states you uh, know total leprosy colonies we cover 150 so initially we will be starting uh, working in uh, 60 leprosy colonies so set up of digital learning and then we will move forward to the other colonies also so i don't your uh, your kids will face the same problem that our kids face that uh, there's lack of money so they will be lucky if they have a uh, smartphone okay. hai na have you have yeah. you done a survey have you done a survey that how many of your students have a smartphone at home no uh, only uh, as you were sharing uh, you know it's like uh, either f- father has or mother has and then again the phone is uh, free only in the evening or may, may on holidays so we were planning to have a room where uh, you know uh, lcd is there at least they can come and join class in in a room which is provided by the leprosy colony people itself and um, uh, this is a rough idea but the thing is since we are still at planning stage experts like you who have been in this field for many years uh, even a single word will be a great uh, you know inspiration i don't uh, i don't we would uh, there are two models we used right yeah and mm-hmm. uh, i would share both these models uh, with you uh, i have yeah. farsha introduce us over email and both the models yeah. are kind of low cost so like i said bharti foundation just because we are bharti foundation we don't use high cost uh, solutions Okay. Right. The first yeah. one that I talked about that how to use. So you, if you do a survey of how many children are getting covered, how many of smartphone. So the first model is how our teachers did Zoom classes. Yeah. You know, so that the safety. <coughs> of the do classes, but uh, you can also couple it up with once a week physical classes, and that is where our other digital class model uh, may be of help to you. Uh, so uh, i think i'll request harsha to connect us and uh, i will have our team tell you both the models right and uh, we use a lot of free apps and free content which is a good thing it doesn't cost us anything right so we'll uh, depending on um, you know the the class wise our academic team has already done segregation which content to use where we'll be very happy to share that with you so that you you don't have to do that you know and spend time and efforts on that and everything is free available only okay. thing that we've done Thank is so hey this is good for class 1 hey this is good for class 2 you know so that will okay. help you yeah. uh, we'll be very happy to share that we'll request harsha to connect us rather than taking space over here time over here so sure, so much thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you harsha uh, sandeep may i request you to unmute yeah. yourself Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, really learned a lot. Hi, Sandeep. Uh, hi, hi, ma'am. Uh, I I had a I had a very basic question. Uh, as someone basic who's... questions, basic questions are the most difficult ones. Sandeep, so are you from an NGO or? Uh... See, I I uh, do run an NGO, but as such, but I am uh, currently an advisor to the government of Delhi, and ah. I work for. Uh, I work with the Minister of Women and Child Development over there on oh, uh, the interventions, in, you know, in the social sector. So, as someone who, uh, like, my question to you, as someone who heads, uh, you know, a, a, a big NGO, uh, how do you choose your interventions? In the sense, do you look? I mean, what is what is the priority? In in my view, there would be three options. One is, do you look at the spatial geography? Like, would you look at working in Punjab or? Jammu and Kashmir, etc. Or second, do you pick up a sector first? Is it education or healthcare or anything else, or maybe a micro sector within education? Uh, and third is, do you, do you choose which community is your is your most important place to work? So how would you go about making a decision to start operations? Uh, if, you know, and doing something new. So we we had that journey around uh, now, eighteen years back. right because we now we are on a chosen path so to say yeah. um so there was uh, at that stage there was a huge consultation between trustees you know and lot of leaders from bharti group companies to actually decide on the issue which is closest to their how- heart 
right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is where Sunil Bharti Mittal was very clear that he wants to work in education. And he said mm -hmm. that because, you know, education is at the core of everything and, you know, would impact. Uh, and uh, Rakesh Mittal brought in the, con you know, he said that while we work in education, but we have to be always very alive to girl, child, right? So anything that Marthi Foundation does, there's always a, there's always a gender parameter which is being, you know, say so if it is attendance, you're looking at how are girls doing, if, you know, there is a success, there's participation in external events, you look at how are girls doing. So gender is a, a key thing when we look at. So we selected our issue uh, basis that. Then the, uh, sorry, Harsha, since uh, the talk was still five now, I fixed up a conference call at 5.15. I'm getting a warning call. So I think I'll take this as a last question. Is that all right, Harsha? Yeah, this is the last question. Last question. Yeah, I'm sorry because I I kept 15 minutes, but uh, sorry, we were Yeah, so we decided on education, but then you know, education is such a big space, Sandeep, right? Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at uh, Arun. He's he's working uh, uh, children, parents with leprosy, right? You can decide to work with uh, children with disability. You can work with children in difficult situations. Or you can decide, listen, teacher's training is something that I will focus on. Correct? Or you can decide, mm -hmm. listen, I'm going to work in curriculum field and I'm going to look at cutting edge uh, things that are going on and stuff like that. So it's easy to say education. It's very difficult to decide what in education. Correct? So mm -hmm. that was a that was a very intense phase of discussions we all uh, we went through. And um, what we decided on was following, we said that we will at the end of the day, whatever you may do, be teachers training, curriculum development, how to do at tech in education, how to look at various focus groups among students. At the end of the day, at least so far, the reality is schools are the hub of everything that gets done. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and if you start looking at education in silos, correct? so you mm -hmm. can train teachers very well. But when teachers return to school, if the leadership does not encourage them, then the entire training can be kept aside, na? correct? If the leadership is saying, why are you doing this? Why do you need, you know, things like this? Do it the way we were doing it. It's over, correct? So we decided that, uh, so we took a few decisions there that we will look at school as a whole because till the time you don't look at a uh, complete picture, right? Mm -hmm. we, we actually may be therefore informing teacher trainers on these kind of trainings are required, you know, because this is how schools need to learn. So we decided to look at schooling as a whole. Second decision we took that, um, that we're not going to become experts overnight. You hire right kind of people and you can say that, hey, we are here to tell you how to do this right, right? We decided to actually go the tough way, Sandeep. We said, let's see whether first, can we deliver quality education? Do we even understand what is quality education? Wow. Okay. Right? That is how Satya Bharti schools came about. And Mr. Mittal was, he said, do not do any Tom Tom. First deliver. First show me that you people understand and, you know, we can actually deliver something on the ground. And and life was made tougher for us. So we said only villages where to get quality of teachers, etc. You know how difficult it is. Correct? Yeah. Infrastructure yeah. is difficult. Right? To beat roads or anything and things mm. like that you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, perceptions about education and things like that right okay? so we were actually given a very very tough mandate in terms of location the only thing we were allowed was that only go into those villages where panchayat invites you to set up a quality education so don't go and impose yourself right okay Right. If people, so you go with the dream. We created our vision of Satya Bharti schools, and we had these youngsters who would go and address gram panchayats. We started with Punjab Sandeep because Punjab is for Bharti group the hometown, right? Yeah. And uh, and uh, we had a lot of uh, credibility there, Sandeep. Right. Uh, see what happens is when you have to set up a model, you have to start from a place at least where you will be listened to. Like I was talking mm -hmm. about when I started my entrepreneurship, there were friends who who came forward to help me, correct? 
so when right. we went to punjab and we said we are from bharti group and they said acha aap mittal sahab ji ki company se you know so there is a respect so they come from wow. ludhiana mm. right yeah 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 so there's a lot of respect for them and so we will listen to and i must say airtel as a brand helped us quite a lot airtel and its credibility um so panchayat yeah. listened to us and we we told them what our dream was then it was only a dream everything in air right but but panchayats invited us into their villages this is the credibility initially when it started it started based on credibility of bharti group and airtel as a group so we started with punjab and like this a restless history then we then we earned our respect right then we earned our respect by running satya bharti schools and sandeep my god that is the reason today when i look at government schools i keep on saying conditions for quality education because i know there are excellent teachers and look at what has happened in delhi right conditions got changed the same teachers Absolutely. and principals are delivering right yeah so i i am in huge admiration for uh, even today whatever government schools are delivering huge admiration so learn the learn very hard way sandeep to respect what is getting delivered learn very hard way like as I, i i very honestly said at no point of time i can say the 100% of satya bharti schools are top performing schools no we always have schools in c grades right mm. you would always have some issue that will happen so sandeep that is what it is and after 8 9 years of running our own schools jab wo kehte hai na bahut sir maar liya deewar pe hum kuch samajh you know you understand <laughs> certain <laughs> yeah then we started uh, started taking baby steps in government school even then i share very honestly to go to government schools and say ki our, our model of change is to bring happiness into school is something not people understand because people understand aap training denge aap hame curriculum denge aap kya denge and we we say ki no hum aapko happiness we will make your school a happy school um but 2013 we started from 2015 16 onwards sandeep we always have requests from all the neighboring government schools wanting to join our program so suppose we working in this school a of yeah right so the neighboring principals are seeing the kind of changes that are coming about uh so we've always have requests touch wood we've been very uh, so i think there is a lot of honesty uh, in what we do we know what we can do we know what we can't do we've learned the hard way when you run your own schools every you know every small decision and its implication right so that wisdom flows into the kind of so we know that ek school mein itne period hote hain now to go mm. and tell principal ki ab we want to introduce a new curriculum to tell principal now i want to take three more of your teachers out for training correct mm-hmm. we struggle mm-hmm. with it mm-hmm. we struggle with it right so the and and some of the daily school principals actually said they said we like bharti foundation program because they come they are that like that bridge who helps us achieve our thing without costing us periods and you know and they said they understand what our challenges are and we do because we are running our own schools so i'll, I'll end over here sandeep i hope i answered your thank question you. thank extent. you so much thank you wonderful to have met you on this note thank you so much mamta for joining us today and answering all the questions so patiently and being as cheerful as you are under the pressure of time that i see <laughs> thank you thank you My so pleasure. much it Completely. was a pleasure to have you same and please do introduce arun to me ha huh? yes i would do that in the subsequent email all right thanks thanks everybody bye